So today on the Small and Supercharged podcast, we are joined by Chloe Brotheridge, who you, if you follow me on social, you'll know because I have read and raved about both of her books, The Anxiety Solution and Brave New Girl, which aren't only brilliant, but they have the most beautiful colours um, on the covers with a bit of foil as well. So you can't, you can't beat that really. Chloe is a hypnotherapist and also an anxiety expert but I'm going to let her introduce herself better and tell us a little bit about her and how she got started. So hello everyone um so yeah my name's Chloe I'm a hypnotherapist and a coach and the author of two books and I primarily work with people with anxiety with confidence issues with self-esteem issues and I got into this work basically because those were my issues as well I had a lot of anxiety, probably as a child, although I probably didn't recognize that's what it was. I would have probably called it shyness at that time, but looking back, it, it was more of a social anxiety. Um, and that certainly you know, got worse as I entered teenage years, and I was having panic attacks and finding social situations very difficult. And it wasn't for about another 10 years after that first panic attack I had when I was about 15, um, that I actually got any help. And having learned much more about anxiety and self-esteem issues, I've, I've learned that it's very common for people to not seek help. Um, I think the average amount of time people spend, according to Anxiety UK, is 10 years before they get any proper professional help. So I was definitely in that camp, just struggling along, thinking that this was just the way I was, that there was not much I could do about the anxiety, I was just an anxious person. And things just got really bad, basically. When I was about 25, I was working two jobs. I was just putting loads of pressure on myself, getting to that point where I was just like, yeah, getting into bed and crying every night, basically. And I knew something had to change. And I started to, well, I actually came across a quote. It sounds really cheesy, but I did come across a quote that really uh, struck, struck me, which was, make peace of mind your priority and organize your life around it. And I just thought, this is what I need to do. I'm not making my mental health a priority. And that's what I need to do in order to, to feel better. And so I started to, to make changes in my life. I quit one of my jobs. I, I, was, I was probably over-exercising at that time. So I started exercising less. Um, that sounds slightly strange, but that actually helped me just to, to take some stress off myself. Um, and yeah, slowly things started to change. And I started to feel a lot better. And um, and the anxiety solution came about because I, yeah, found that I was working with people who struggled with the, the exact same things that, that I had, which was um, not being able to switch off, having too many thoughts, worrying about everything, um, not feeling good about myself. And I realized that so many other people experienced this. And so I wanted to um, share the things that had helped me and the things that I'd learned um, about feeling better with other people and that's how that came about that's amazing and um, I mean do you think if we start with what anxiety is because I think a lot of people it's, it's a really common thing you hear people say they're anxious they have anxiety and I know depression is different but I feel like it's on the same kind of spectrum it's a mental health issue but I appreciate it is different which I'm, I'm sure you'll explain but what is anxiety what's the difference between feeling anxious and anxiety and then how, how does depression also fit into that spectrum? Because I know they are on a spectrum, aren't they? Yeah, so that's a, a question that I get asked all the time. How do we differentiate between normal anxiety and anxiety, the mental health issue? Um, so anxiety is a really broad term to describe a lot of different things, really. There are so many different types of anxiety, um, from general anxiety, which is basically worrying about things and, and worrying about a lot of things and not being able to stop worrying. Um, and there's social anxiety, which is a fear of judgment, a fear of social situations. There's OCD, there's specific phobias. So these are all types of anxiety. And um, people don't necessarily fit into one of those boxes. You could have multiple types of anxiety. Um, but the most common symptoms are a lot of them are physical. I think that's what people don't realize when they don't know anything about anxiety, that it's very, very physical. So you really feel it in your body as tension, a racing heart, sweating, shaking, digestive issues like IBS is really linked to anxiety because if we're holding on loads of tension in our, in our stomachs, then that can you know, mess up our digestive system. 
Um, so it's really very physical and, and going all the way up to sort of panic attacks, which might be the peak of kind of the physical, physical expression of anxiety. And then the mental side of it, which is um, having a busy mind, worrying, um, having obsessive thoughts or very negative thoughts, um, and even expressing itself as not being able to concentrate on things or procrastinating as well, because when we're anxious, we put things off and then we put things off and then that makes us even more anxious. Um, yeah, even to things like being irritable with people, that's a sign of anxiety as well. So if you find yourself snapping at your partner more often or your kids, um, that can be, you know, side effect of feeling anxious and, you know, anxiety is actually normal. Um, it's a normal human emotion. Everyone worries from time to time. Everyone is going to feel afraid from time to time. But where it's a, a problem is if it's happening, um, you know, on a daily basis or if it's getting in the way of your life. And it is something that should be diagnosed by a doctor, really. They will ask you questions, get you to fill out basically like a, a quiz, I guess, that. Um, you know, ask you certain questions about how often you're experiencing it and uh, how long it's been going on. And they may diagnose anxiety from that. Um, so that's the way that it's kind of diagnosed. That's the kind of the medical way that people will differentiate between normal anxiety and, and the, the kind of clinical anxiety. Um, but I don't think people, I think it kind of, the word gets thrown around quite a lot, like, oh, I'm so anxious. But it might be a very short term anxiety that's nothing to, to really, I mean, you don't need to go to the doctor for it. Um, it's normal to be nervous before a job interview. It's normal to worry if you're being made redundant. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a mental health issue. No, completely. And obviously we mentioned the, the doctor element. And I think that's something that's really important to emphasize that whilst you can do you know, things like reading your book is incredible and you can do different kinds of therapy, I don't think people should be afraid to go to the doctor. And I think there's this stigma around it, which I think is being broken down with lots of very positive mental health campaigns. But it always... When you said about it takes people 10 years to actually seek help, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's something that you need to address. And actually, from what you've said as well, from your own experience, the change in your life when you do address it, however you address it, can be just massive, can't it? Yeah, I'd really encourage people to not wait around before getting help because the sooner you treat anxiety, the better chance you have of really overcoming it. And it is one of those things that can get worse if we don't do anything about it. For example, in, in social anxiety, um, and this is what happened for me, I just isolated myself, um, wasn't getting help. And so the fear of people becomes worse because you're not exposing yourself to people. So anxiety can kind of spiral a bit like that so there's nothing to be ashamed of it's it's 22 percent of women feel anxious all or most of the time and about 15 percent of men so it's incredibly common one in four of us will have a mental health issue in our lives and it's just part of being human it's part of having a mind and there's no shame in asking for help in the same way as if we you know broke our arm or we need to go to the doctor we should have the same attitude that it's okay to to do that and I think as well when you're saying about the quiz at the doctors, it sounds fun. Um, <laughs> but again, that might be something that if you have got anxiety or if you've got depression, again, that would be flagged at that point and you could then seek the help and seek the solutions to, you know, help rectify the issue. Absolutely. And there's even, if people Google NHS mood quiz, you can do the quiz um, online and it can be, I mean, it's not, it's not designed to diagnose it. You still have to go to your doctor, but it can give you a sense of, yeah, maybe this is, you know, more of an issue than I've been giving it credit for. Um, so people can look at that if they want to take a first step before going to the doctor. Sure. Now you said that um, anxiety is a very physical, um, obviously it's a mental health issue, but it can have very physical symptoms. So what's the kind of mechanics behind that? Why do we get these physical feelings when it's something that you might think it's only your mind? What's the kind of mechanism? And it's to do a bit with evolution, isn't it? Yeah, so I would even question, I know it is a mental health issue, but it, it impacts the body so much. And we store a lot of, um, you know, our nervous system is on our whole bodies and we can store a lot of emotions in our bodies. Um, it has to do with the fight or flight response primarily, which is where our body um, increases levels of adrenaline and your heart races because it is helping you to 
um, run away or fight what it is perceiving as the threat. So when we were evolving, there would have been times when we might have been attacked by a rival tribe or a wild animal. We'd need to run away. We need to have energy to fight. And the fight or flight mechanism kicking in is what gives you that extra energy and that adrenaline. Um, however, in modern life, we don't necessarily have these sorts of life-threatening situations happen very often. And yet this same fight or flight response is being triggered by being late for a meeting, for example, or having like loads of unopened emails. And our bodies still go into this stress response, still we still feel as though it can feel life or death. You know, if you're, I don't know, if you're going to speak in public and you've got social anxiety, it can really feel as though you're going to die. And it, and it sounds very dramatic, but that is how it feels in your body at that time. Um, so it's kind of an, an evolutionary leftover. I want to say leftover. I'm sure it is, it is helpful. But um, the fact that modern life will trigger these stressful um these stressful responses means that we can find ourselves in fight or flight a lot of the time so do you think anxiety is something that's more of a sort of a modern day not condition but obviously if we go back a, a whole lot of time as you say it was life and death situations that would trigger this response and today it can be as you say public speaking and i know that feeling when you feel like you might be having a heart attack you kind of feel that crushing oh god i can't breathe oh this isn't very good oh no, I'm going to have a heart attack in, on stage. And it, your mind goes, you're going to have a heart attack on stage. It's going to be really bad. And then everything else kicks in. Um, but as you say, our, our kind of ancestors from a long time ago, that wouldn't have been a thing. So is it the fact that now we put ourselves under more pressure, but in very different ways that has increased people's anxiety issues, do you think? So I think our lives are very different to how they would have been when we evolved in tribes, which would have been small groups of people, maybe, I don't know, I think I've, I've read things about there, maybe 150 people in the tribe or 200 people in the tribe and people really supporting each other, um, not being under that um, daily pressure. So there might be pressures that come along, but not that kind of relentless daily pressure that we have. Um, but I think things like the, the fact that a lot of us are socially isolated, like loneliness levels are really high in, in modern times. Um, a lot of us are not that physically active. You know, when we were in tribes, we would have been exercising every day, running around. That burns off that adrenaline. And what we do in, in modern life is if we've gone through something stressful. We just continue to sit at our desks or um, mm. we're not using up that extra energy. So it kind of stays in the body and it that creates tension and um, yeah, it doesn't feel very good. So we're very, yeah, our lives are very different. And of course the pace of life is faster than it's ever been. Technology means that we never switch off from things. Um, we know all about world events. So we've got this sense that life is uncertain. Um, it's not just this small world of the tribe and those 150 people. It's like a massive thing to, contemplate and I think that can create anxiety yeah, um, when you hear about horrific things happening in different parts of the world or happening to other people you do well I do think oh my god that could happen to me my loved ones etc etc and as you say if it used to be that you had you were worried about 150 people they were your they were your kind of problem in inverted commas but now it does feel like you've got 7.6 billion people <laughs> that you need to be thinking about which is going to make make anyone feel on edge, isn't it, to be yeah. honest. Um, I mean, how, what do you think the role of sort of, you mentioned technology, but what do you think the role of social media has in anxiety in terms of possibly negative effects or possibly positive effects too? Yeah, I think it's, it's more complicated than it at first appears because it's very easy to demonise social media and say that it's the root of all evil. But the only reason that social media is negative I think it's because of other forces in our lives like um, I don't know advertising and the fact that there's a whole there's whole industries designed to make us feel bad about ourselves to sell things so I think it really depends how you use it and I would encourage people to find and follow people that look like them that are diverse that are spreading a positive message and really try to avoid following the people that trigger 
really negative feelings or comparison or feeling like you're not good enough um or even things that are like overly materialistic i think that can put a lot of pressure on us because yeah we feel like we never have enough we need to work harder so we can buy more this is something i've been thinking about a lot about how like capitalism in itself um fuels our anxiety because um of this cycle that we get into ourselves of, of overworking to earn more money working in a job we don't like to buy more stuff yeah so i think it's how you use it and and we can be mindful use it mindfully and it can be a massive force for good i do think as well when we look at social media we see this sort of often perfect snapshot of someone's day but you don't know that they're sat there working at their immaculately tidy desk that's not what's happening here. It's a complete disaster here. But they're working their immaculately tidy desk with their beautiful hair and makeup and their fresh cup of coffee. But you don't know that they have been screaming at their children that they are stressed beyond belief that all this other stuff is imploding around them because that snapshot, everything looks perfect. And we as consumers of social media, I think, can get into a habit of looking at these pictures and going, well, my life isn't like that. And even if we were quite happy before we saw the picture, we look at it and go, my desk isn't that tidy. I, my hair doesn't ever look that good. And you can start to feel subconsciously a lot worse. Do you, have you seen much of that? Totally. I think that's so, so true. I mean, I can understand why, I don't know, influencers and things portray this perfect image because that's what they're paid for. And that's actually, it is these beautiful images that get all the likes and, that sort of thing so it's kind of um you can understand it but i think i think it's happening more that more people are being vulnerable and sharing the other side and, and letting people know that it's not all perfect but i think it's such an important reminder that we are just seeing that snapshot that no one's life is perfect everyone struggles with something everyone struggles with something and um just to remind ourselves that it's not it's not really reality and if it really is bothering people to step away from it, even if you just, I don't know, delete Instagram for a week or something, if you're not feeling that great, just to give, to do that as an act of self care, um, you know, don't put yourself through having to see that if you're not in a good space. No, absolutely. So if you had some tips for people who are not anxious, like we were saying, you're anxious for a job interview, although obviously if that's something they are concerned about, they need to go and, you know, speak to somebody or seek help. But have you got any tips for people who do feel like they are, have got anxiety in the kind of sense that we're talking about? So I would say the number one thing that I hear from people um, that, that kind of holds them back is the way that they're speaking to themselves. And this might be really obvious to some people. It might just be a reminder or this might be completely a new idea, but we all have a voice in our heads. And I always ask my clients in the first session, how do you speak to yourself? And a lot of the time they look at me quite confused, like I'm, confu I'm, I'm accusing them of having a voice in their head or something like that. But <laughs> the truth is we all have this inner critic. We all have this voice that is quite often negative, commenting on things, telling us we're, we're rubbish, telling us we should be better, do better, look better. And this can create so much anxiety. And the first step is just to really become aware of that inner critic um, and recognize that what it's saying, just because it's you're, you have a thought, it doesn't mean that it's true. So really starting to question those thoughts and, um, and turning it around as much as possible, saying to yourself, how would I speak to a friend in this situation? And trying. To remind yourself to speak to yourself in that way because it doesn't actually benefit us I and mean, we know this if we were to say to a friend when they'd had a bad day you're such an idiot I can't believe you've messed up again this is so typical of you you're useless if we send that to a friend we we know that's not the right thing to say it's not helpful that friend is not going to be really inspired and motivated to like have a great day the following day and and yet we do it to ourselves so it's just remembering that we can bring out the best in ourselves by being kind and by being gentle with ourselves. So that's like the number one tip that I have to share. About that's anxiety. a really good one. So I think um, there's a really good book called The Chimp Paradox and it's the chimp, isn't it? Who's the one who kind of chatters away. And I'm sure I read somewhere, one theory on it is it's kind of the way to keep you safe. But 
it's sort of not because it's trying to stop you making mistakes again perhaps but actually that's not how we work totally yeah it can often have a good intention to try and help you to be better or do better next time but that doesn't actually that's not the effect and often these this inner critic comes from our childhoods so if you look at for example how did your parents speak to you when you were a child if they were critical if they were critical of themselves if they were hard on themselves we can absorb that and copy that and take that on board and that becomes the way that we speak to ourselves as adults so it is something we learn at times as well. And um, that means we can unlearn it as well. What means we can unlearn it. So you mentioned as well, sort of self-care, taking a bit of a step back from social media or taking a, you know, changing things to give yourself a bit of sort of mental time off. Are there any tips around that that you could offer people? Because I think that again, in today's world, we're so busy, we've got a million things to do. Actually putting ourselves anywhere near the top of our own priority list is is not a thing for most people yeah i think i think some of it comes down to um self-care having a bit of a bad reputation that it's selfish mm -hmm. or that if you have a break that that's you know not a good use of time but actually if you think about how we're able to be when we're well rested when we're calm we're better partners and parents and we're better at our work because we can focus or better you know managers and everyone benefits when we take care of ourselves so I, I suggest for people to lose that idea that it's selfish and actually remember that it is something that's essential and helps you to be the best that you can be for other people and I think it does come down to priorities because ev everyone's busy we're all busy but you know if I was to say to listeners right I'm going to give you 50 quid for every time you have a bath this week, you would find the time, you know, you'd make the time to do that. And so it's not so much an issue of time, but more an issue of priorities and what we're making important. So one thing that I quite often suggest people to do is to actually schedule in um, self-care. So even if that's just having a break at lunchtime to have a walk or listening to a guided meditation for 10 minutes in the morning, or just having an early night, put it in your diary, let other people know, like let other family members know, like, right, this is my time to have a bath or have an early night. Um, and treating that appointment as, you know, an appointment with a very important person that you really want to keep. Um, yeah, scheduling it in is another thing that I really recommend. I think as well, when you said, you know, people think it might be indulgent or whatever, but it can just be going for a walk or cooking yourself proper food that's not, you know, pre-packaged and kind of supporting yourself nutritionally or having a bath or going to bed early or you know using some nice moisturizer it doesn't have to be you know spa days away or it can be if you want but it, it can just be little things can't it totally yeah I think self-care is whatever it is for you I think it's quite a good practice just to maybe write down 10 things that feel like self-care for you so that might be going and borrowing the neighbor's dog and going for a walk or um you know chatting with a friend or writing in a journal a lot of people don't like baths a lot of people don't find baths very relaxing so it doesn't have to be just baths <laughs> <laughs> no absolutely it's got to be what works for you but um yeah i think that's really really positive because i know a lot of people do get anxiety around different things and um yeah it can be very it can take over a lot of your life or can make your life much harder perhaps than it needs to be so your second book, so your first book was The Anxiety Solution. Obviously, it's an amazing book if you're listening and you have got any interest in anything we've talked about, which I'm sure you have if, you've li if you're listening. It's a really, really good book. And I like the way it's written as well, because it's like I'm kind of chatting to a friend. I'm not being bamboozled by science and synapses and whatever they're called. You can see I've got... <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of like, quite involved, almost medical stuff out there about anxiety, which is interesting, but... You can't, I can't necessarily apply it, whereas I found it really useful. Um, but the, the, your second book is called Brave New Girl, which I like because it made me think of Brave New World, which I get is the whole point of it, um, and the colours and the foil. So this is more about confidence, isn't it? And how do you see the two related, anxiety and confidence? Obviously, they are they're very much related. 
Yeah, so I sort of see this as the follow on from the anxiety solution. So once you've worked on your anxiety and you're in a, a bit of a calmer place, then it's time to work on confidence and go out into the world more and get better at speaking up and asking for what you want and setting boundaries. And I find that almost all of the time, confidence and anxiety are linked together, not for everyone, but, but very often um, and have, you know, their roots in self-esteem issues and yeah, not feeling good enough. So they do seem very linked to me, but I, I would say Brave New Girl is, is the follow on. Um, and again, I, I spoke to my clients and the people that um, engage with me online and, and wanted to know what they were struggling with. And it was things around not being able to say no, feeling as though you have to say yes to things. You don't want to let people down. You're worried about what people think if you say no. Um, not being able to speak up and um, ask for what they want or have difficult conversations. Um, things around imposter syndrome, which is where you feel as though you are a fraud and you're going to get found out at any moment. And it's something like 66% of women and 54% of men feel like imposters. So huge numbers of people. Um, so it's really addressing all of the, the specific ways that we struggle with confidence. And again, just giving practical things that we can do to, to feel more, more free to be ourselves. And do you see, find a lot of people have kind of confidence? I'm doing a wave signal with my hand, which isn't really helping, but they do things that make them feel more confident. And then something will happen and they go back down and up. Or do you feel, is it more like a, a continual curve? How do you see it in your clients? Um, so I think we often think of confidence as being this fixed thing that we either have or we don't have. And some people are just born with confidence and, you know, they feel confident in every situation. But I, I do think confidence goes up and down in our lives. And um, it's also something that we can cultivate. It's a practice. It's a habit. And it's really easy to look at certain people and think that they just feel confident all the time but actually it's common for us to learn later about people that appear really confident and that actually do doubt themselves so um, Michelle Obama is a really good example of this she seems really confident but she's talked about how she experiences imposter syndrome that she experiences self-doubt at times and there's loads of examples of this you know public figures who who feel like this I think when we go through a change in our lives, when we have a setback, a redundancy, I hear this a lot from people who've recently had children, um, they can find that their confidence takes the knock. And um, it is about perhaps rebuilding that and taking steps maybe to challenge yourself to do the things that you're a little bit afraid to do. And having practices around reminding yourself of why you're valuable and why you're good enough and um, why you deserve the success that you have or you deserve the things that you have in your life and so I think there's lots we can do to to tap into that confidence so even if someone it does feel like they've had a setback or their confidence has had a dip um don't think that it's always going to be that way because um it is something that we can tap into and grow sure so have you noticed sort of more recently that confidence has become something that's more talked about, that is more of an issue for people, or is it something that you think that's always been, it's just we've, we've only really started vocalising it more recently? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say because the world is changing so much. Um, I think it, it does seem from the, the data that it affects women slightly more than men, that women struggle with confidence and things like imposter syndrome more than men. And, um, you know, that can be for obvious reasons that, that a lot of workplaces may be male dominated, that um, it was only, you know, a couple of generations ago that women didn't really work. Um, so there's, there's things that we're adapting to. And I mean, there are things around the way that we speak to um, little girls growing up that can mean that they potentially grow up being less confident so for example um having a lot of focus on the way that we look as children you know boys don't get told how nice their outfit is girls that's the focus um girls are more likely to be overprotected we're not necessarily and this is different for everyone but there seems to be a trend that with little girls we're not allowed to fail we're not allowed to fall over and learn that we can 
survive, whereas little boys are allowed to play in the mud and um, be a bit more free in that way. So there, there are theories that for, the, for those reasons, we lack confidence. Um, and it is something that's getting spoken about more. I think even the term imposter syndrome wasn't really um, commonly known. And there are lots of people that have never heard that term before, but we're hearing about it more and more and celebrities are talking about it in the press. And I think once you know that that's a thing, that there is such a syndrome that you really feel like you're a fraud and you realize you're not the only one that feels like that. Um, it's quite comforting and it, and it can help us to take steps to overcome it once we know what that is. So I think it's only a good thing that we're talking about it more. And I hope that, you know, the younger generations are going to be more, more confident as things are starting to change in our society as well. I think as well, when you have, big figures like you said Michelle Obama and other people coming out saying that they have imposter syndrome and we look at them and go how that how can you possibly feel like a fraud you are incredible you are this you're that the other it makes you realize that it maybe isn't reality if you feel like a fraud it doesn't mean you are a fraud because we don't see these people like that whatsoever which is really positive that people are speaking about it more yeah it's so true and we just don't know what's happening below the surface and i think as well it's it helps to normalize it it normalizes the the fact that to doubt yourself is normal as a human being to feel scared is normal we're all going to feel scared at times um apart from psychopaths psychopaths apparently don't feel fear <laughs> so the 99 percent of us <laughs> um I think it normalizes it. The more we talk about it, the less ashamed we become about these things and the more likely we are to get help. And, you know, the less ashamed we are, the more acceptance we can bring. Because I know for me, like, accepting the fact that, oh, I get nervous in some situations or, oh, I find those things scary. Accepting myself for that actually helps you to overcome it to a certain extent because the fact that we beat ourselves up about things is half the problem a lot of the time. So do you have any tips for people who are dealing with confidence issues, suffering with imposter syndrome, any tips that can help them to overcome that or understand it a bit more? Yes. So I think it's really important that we give ourselves credit for the things that we've done, the things that we've achieved, um, the things that we have in our lives. With imposter syndrome, it's very common to pass things off as luck. So it was just luck that you managed to, um, you know, make all the friends that you have. It was just luck that you've had this successful relationship for so many years, or it was just luck that you've set up this business. You know, it wasn't anything to do with you. Um, but really giving yourself credit for that and just recognizing what was it about you that made that happen? Was it your ability to network with people, your ability to study hard, your ability to um, be creative? And just really allowing yourself to it to acknowledge that and, and celebrate that in yourself because that helps us to appreciate ourselves more and know that it wasn't just luck. Yeah. Um, another thing I think is really important to do is to challenge ourselves. And when we're when we're struggling with confidence or when we're anxious, it's very we feel compelled often just to avoid the things that trigger that anxiety or that fear. So um, one thing that I talk to people a lot about is, is going live on Instagram stories, for example, or um, going out and going to a networking event. Um, and if that makes you feel afraid, that's not a reason to avoid it and run away. It might be that actually that's the thing that you need to do to really grow your confidence, to, to walk towards the thing that you're afraid of. And so I would suggest to people to really break things down into steps. So you don't necessarily have to go and speak on stage to a thousand people tomorrow, but you know, maybe it's about um, going and having a conversation with someone in the coffee shop that you're having coffee in or reaching out to someone online and asking if they want to meet up in real life or what, whatever tiny step is going to help you to get towards your goal. And each each time you challenge yourself, you learn that you don't die. You learn that you survive, that the thing is not going to kill you. And that gives us a sense of trust in ourselves. We you know, know that it's, it's not such an unknown 
thing that we can handle it and it gives us a lot of confidence so I would suggest people to, to challenge themselves. It was interesting actually before I, I was speaking to some friends about that I was interviewing you and I said has anyone got anything that they'd like me to talk about and um, one that lady said about complacency having an effect on confidence which I think is exactly what you've said you become kind of you stay within your comfort zone you don't push it you kind of coast along and then it feels like a real when you've got to push yourself or do something because you've got into that habit I mean that's you would definitely agree with that from what you've just said yeah definitely and it's so easy for that to happen because no one wants to feel really scared it's like a very unpleasant feeling um yeah so if you ask someone that has almost got into a bit of a rut with it um firstly try and get support if you can if there's a coach or a therapist or even a friend that can help you hold you accountable or you can do it with someone so that you can encourage each other and just do it in a very step-by-step -step way and know that you're brave just for giving things a try you don't need to be amazing at doing whatever it is that you're doing giving things a try is all that you need to do and being kind to yourself through that process as well um, can really help you to to slowly kind of expand what's what's possible for you no that's really really good advice and small steps as well which is something that throughout the whole of our discussion it's it's not the big things that can change the game it is the having a bar going to bed early just pushing yourself a little bit so saying hello to somebody if you're in a coffee shop and normally you would just be sat there looking at your coffee and not trying not to make eye contact it can be the little things that can build up to the big things in terms of anxiety and in confidence as well definitely yeah well that has been amazing what i'm going to do is i'm going to offer as a prize both of your books on my instagram on the evening that this goes live so if you're listening to this in real time go and look um, they're brilliant books so they're available on amazon and i'll put the links in the show notes to both of those as well but can you tell us all the places where we can find and follow you in a completely non-stalker way yes yeah so so my website is karmau.com and if people head over to karmau.com forward slash free i've got a free anxiety toolkit which has um, like a hypnotherapy session and affirmations mp3 some worksheets and hopefully people will find that really helpful um is it, is it karma hyphen you yeah it doesn't matter it could be hyphen you or karma you yeah well, and that's well. karma as in calm and relax not not good karma with a k <laughs> calm and relax karma <laughs> um and the main place i am on social media is instagram i'm at chloe brotheridge and i post um, videos every day just little reminders where i'm talking about ways to feel calmer and, and feel more confident um so yeah come and find me on there and you have a podcast too don't you i do yes i've forgotten about that so it's called the karma you podcast and every week i'm interviewing guests from um, mental health and nutrition and, and wellness and just giving lots of tips on how to be calmer and happier so there's lots and lots of people to go away with there that they can do for free as well they can actually explore the things you've talked about the toolkit the podcast lots of reading and you know obviously you do have sort of services and you've got a course as well i think that's launching yeah so i've got i do two kind of group courses that are online one for anxiety and one for confidence and they run like every quarter um so I, i'll talk about that on my instagram and in my emails when when they come around perfect Thank you so, so much for speaking to me today. I really appreciate it. I've been a big fan since I, I can't remember why I found out about your book. I think it was Instagram, actually. Somebody else had said, you must read, you know, on their Instagram, you must read this, it's brilliant. And I thought, okay, I'm up for that. And then when the second one came out, I pre-ordered it. And I don't pre-order an awful lot because I think, oh, I'll wait until it's here. Um, but they're both really, really good books, really nice reads and um, really positive too i think that a defining one to read that and not feel a bit better or feel like they can get better i think that's the thing as well it's it's hope and positivity which can start to set you on the right track to improving whatever issues you've got going on thank you thanks so much for talking to me i've loved this conversation thank you